All right. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, maybe, uh, for some of you. Uh, my name is uh, Andrei Dunida. I work as scientific coordinator at the Institute for Advanced Study at Central European University. And I'm also a, one of the coordinators of the expert group on civil society research in the EU Russia Forum. And tonight, my dear friend and colleague, Yelena Belkorov and I, we are welcoming you to our online discussion titled International Cooperation of Civil Society Actors in Europe During the Pandemic. This is the fourth discussion in the series of our online discussions on the effects and implications of the global pandemic of COVID-19 for civil society actors, both in Europe and in Russia. Previously, that was in 2020, in the year that we all want to forget about. <laughs> Previously, we discussed uh, several issues related to this big, big theme, namely the digital and online lives that we all found ourselves in and the implications of that for civil society actors, how the pandemic affected the fundraising and financial sus sustainability of civil societies, both in Europe and Russia, and how it affected volunteering. And finally, tonight, we're getting down to perhaps one of the biggest challenges of this pandemic, uh, the biggest challenges for all of us, but especially for civil society organizations and civil society actors as one of the most internationalized actors. Many of them uh, develop throughout their work close connections and ties across borders. Uh, we all know about the massive experience of uh, international cooperation between Russian and European civil society organizations and between C European civil society organizations in Europe. So uh, tonight we would like to discuss uh, what happened when the global world ceased to exist for all of us suddenly and we when we found ourselves in a situation of global disconnection when the travel was halted and it was no longer are possible to move around, to see our colleagues, meet with them and discuss the things that we're all interested in. Uh, what are the implications of this once again? How did this affect and is affecting us up to date? And what, is the, what are those experiences that we can share with each other? Uh, Yelena and I will be moderating this discussion and before I give floor to Elena uh, to say a couple of words about our expert group and uh, EU Russia Civil Society Forum, I'm just going to briefly introduce our excellent panel for tonight. We have a panel of excellent speakers who will share their experiences and knowledge and expertise with us. We have with us tonight Larisa Diriglazova, professor at Tomsk, Tomsk State University the head of the master program in European studies and the head of Jean Monnet Center for European Studies at Tomsk State University. We have Simona Polderini, research fellow at the Department of Economics in the University of Perugia in Italy. Ulla Pape, postdoctoral researcher at Freie Universität Berlin, a free university in Berlin and a member of our expert group on civil society. And so is Simona. Uh, the member of our expert group that he then will uh, shortly uh, say a couple of words about. And we have Anna Sevartian, executive director of the EU Russia Civil Society Forum, which is one of the supporters of this uh, series of online discussions, along with Friedrich Ebert Foundation uh, in St. Petersburg. And before we start, allow me to say several kind words to both the EU Russia Civil Society Forum who hosts our expert group and supported uh, the series of discussions and to Friedrich Ebert Foundation. Thank you very much for endorsing us with this uh, idea and supporting us throughout this series. Uh, before I uh, come back and, and basically uh, we start our discussion and I will uh, get down to my job as a moderator, allow me to uh, give floor to Yelena Belakurova uh, she will um, also say a couple of words. Yana. Good evening, colleagues. I'm um, 
in St. Petersburg right now, so I'm going to speak Russian. Welcome to this discussion today. This is the final fourth discussion in this uh, discussion series. And I see that uh, many people join us for the first time. And uh, so let me say a couple of words about this initiative. We organize these discussions together with uh, EU Russia Civil Society Forum. And this group, I am sharing my screen now, has been working for five years within the Civil Society Forum to, to see, to pinpoint which issues civil society faces both in EU and Russia. This research started in 2016 and uh, every year we have been publishing, uh, uh, we have been carrying out research in various uh, European countries and these are the examples from different years and all reports are available on the website. Uh, you can see the link here and you can review these reports and the authors who compiled these reports from various European countries, 20 European countries and, and Russia, are members of our, our expert group. And we decided to, during the pandemic, uh, to host this uh, series of discussion together with them to see how organizations, civil society organizations are doing in this challenging times. It's uh, very good to see Ulla from Germany and Simone from Italy today with us so that uh, we would be able to uh, share our knowledge and experience. Since we have a rather large audience today, we'd like to get to know you a bit better. So we prepared several polls that are going to pop up during the discussion. And uh, so I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves, uh, to indicate which country are you from, you're from, and how relevant are these problems to you. So please do the poll and we will we'll get back to discussing the results of this poll later. We'll ask our experts to comment on these results. Thank you. This is it for me, Andre. Uh, so uh, let's get down to business then. Uh, we have uh, we will proceed in the following uh, fashion. We formulated two big questions for our experts, and you may have also seen those questions in the announcement. We wanted to ask them uh, how the pandemic affected uh, civil society organizations and in their international cooperation and connections. On the practical side, on the practical uh, level, what happened to the joint projects, realization of, of planned events and uh, exchange of ideas. And we, want, we were uh, massively interested in what happened with the international cooperation in the situation when the communication, live communication, is no longer possible. So we will start with the first question, namely, how has the pandemic uh, affected joint projects, planned events and exchange of ideas in time of restricted movement and borders? And how do civil society organizations in Europe and Russia sustain their relations with the foreign partners? If we may, I would suggest we proceed in the order that I announced our speakers. And I would kindly ask Clarissa to um, intervene and uh, elaborate a little bit on this question. Every speaker will have up to seven minutes to elaborate on the question, and then we will open the floor for the questions from the audience. Without further ado, Larissa, it's great to see you joining us tonight. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, or rather evening, dear colleagues and listeners. First, I would like to express my deepest gratitude uh, I'm so happy to see Elena Belakurova and Andrei here on the screen in a remote 
manner distantly uh, but at the same time we're happy to be a part of this discussion also I have an imposter syndrome why because I work in a state university Tomsk is a state uh, educational institution I'm a professor a teacher uh, by profession and I hadn't been taking part in the previous discussions and, uh, and still since I'm a curious person now let's see and I'm uh, a very active uh, person. I take part in lots of international uh, programs and uh, events, and I'm organizing them. That was the reason, I think, why the organizers have called me in, summoned the troops, as they say. And now I'll tell you how the pandemic uh, impacted our experience of carrying out international projects with our partners in Europe and other countries. First and foremost, uh, the pandemic hit me unexpectedly. In the end of February, I was at a meeting in Moscow. There is an expert network called Euronet, which unites 20 Russian and 20 European experts uh, talking about international policy. And it was a 13th meeting in a row that was held in the end of February, at which uh, our future was discussed and the way the EU and Russia would go hand in glove into the future. This Euronet, uh, Euren, I'm sorry, network is a public diplomacy project, or at least stays under the auspices of it, and it's supported by the European Union and the Russian Council on International Affairs. I don't know whether it's um, a public society organization or it's a hybrid. Well, it's up to you to judge. It was the final meeting. It was the last meeting live we had. It was the last live discussion we had. As an outcome, we decided to continue our deliberations uh, remotely. All subsequent three meetings were canceled. But the results of our deliberations were published. The way our relations with the EU will continue um, are available on the UN and RSND website and the presentation we had delivered back then got a big coverage and it was uh, widely discussed in the media. Right from Moscow, I should have traveled to Turin. Mm, that's quite okay for people who live outside Moscow. I have a four hour difference. Mm, Torino, yeah. And I had to travel to Torino for an internship, although, of course, many people um, talk me against that um, because uh, in Italy the situation was already pretty grave. However, a colleague of mine, a professor from Torino University, told me that everything is okay and I could come. So I, sp I, I went there and it was a very empty travel. By empty, I mean that there were not so many contacts, no lectures. I just had one informal meeting and that's it. Although I did spend a couple of days and I came back to Tomsk only on the 10th of March when the lockdown in Italy was already announced, when transportation was no longer available. I mean, inside the country, the bus service has been suspended, uh, any regular railway transportation has been suspended and uh, flights were cancelled. So it was my final trip in 2020, somewhere outside Russia, all the rest were cancelled. And I had a lot of other... Um, trips that I had, wanted to have. The Woodrow Wilson Center, for example, was holding a conference in Prague and many other institutions had their programs canceled. For example, we used to have an academic mobility tour and we wanted to go to the free uh, university in Brussels with which we have uh, an academic exchange agreement signed and we had to cancel that as well. So. In 2019, I used to have 13 to 15 travels. In 2020, I only had one. Everything else was moved to a remote work. And a lot of events, even more than I had planned for in 2020, did took place, but online. And it's a pretty strange experience, I need to say. But on one hand, it's really hard. But on a positive note, a lot of events that um, were then uh, brought online actually expanded the coverage, expanded uh, our audience quite a while, uh, quite a lot. Amongst the audience today here, we have my students, um, and they could have 
been present on all other conferences and events which previously were closed for their attendance because uh, they were either top level conferences or closed circuit conferences um, so we broadened the scope of those conferences we also had another amazing event why amazing because we conducted a meeting of our students online with consular general of the u.s in yekaterinburg before the elections before the u.s elections and that event was attended by more than 90 people which nine zero which would never have been possible i mean bringing students to meet the general consul uh, wouldn't have wouldn't be possible considering the current state of um relations between russia and the us so in the end as a, a conclusion i would like to say that um, the pandemic did cut down on the opportunities to meet head to head or face to face a lot of opportunities which we had planned um, were not realized but at the same time uh, a new vista was opened and a whole range of other events uh, were now made available where we could have attracted uh, well where we attracted um, so many people we never thought that we will be able to bring uh, together before for example the brussels center has uh, started doing some events online but that concludes my deliberations because the time the time is over um, often discussed unintended consequence of, of the pandemic, right? So we all moved to the online world, but did it bring us actually closer to each other? Did it expand the audience of, for our events? Looking forward to hear uh, some more opinions from uh, our other speakers. And the next one is Simona. Simona, you're very welcome to share your views on that. You're muted, Simona, we cannot hear you. Yes, thank you. First of all, let me say thank you for this uh, invitation. I'm very honored to be with you and to share our experience, the Italian experience. Um, as uh, Andre say, I'm a research fellow at the University of Perugia, where I'm mainly involved in the research of social enterprises, with particular focus on the Italian case as well as I'm studying from the Italian perspective, the civil society organizations and the nonprofit sector uh, in general. Um, well, let's start speaking about um, the, let's say the Italian case. Um, as you know, the Italy was um, affected terribly from the, the COVID. Uh, that was around one year ago when everything started. And so the impact of the COVID in our general society was very terrible, that even is more terrible for the civil society organizations. Um, in order to answer the um, above presented the two questions, I made um, some informal interviews. I mean, I contacted some of my connections and I had a very you know, informal conversation about this uh, interesting question, just to know their experience. And, and from these, um, let's say, you no know, conversation, these interviews, I made three main considerations that I would like to, to share with you with the hope that they will be relevant or helpful for our uh, audience. And the first one was regarding the level of the internationalization of the civil society organization. I mean, what I realized that the the COVID impact in a different way according to the main characteristic of the civil society organization. So it was the effect of the COVID in the Italian civil organization was not equal for everyone. It depends on the characteristic of the civil society organizations. So the first aspect is related to the level of their internationalization. So um, I, we can make a two main groups in terms of Italian characteristic. And the first one is more linked to a traditional sort of civil society organization that are actually are not internationalized. So are mainly focused on Italian relations and are more located to the Italian territory. 
for many reasons, language boundaries and, and so on. So for this sort of civil society organization, the COVID was really terrible because basically they, they stopped at all their activity. They, they couldn't interact anymore with other uh, actors or civil society organizations. While the second group, let's say the more, uh, the new one of the Italian civil uh, society organization are more international. So um, civil society organization that had before the COVID already international relations, international partnerships. In, they were already in a sort of an international network. For this sort of civil society organization, in some way, they had, um, they take advantage from the situation in terms that they received a lot of great help from around the world. Because at the beginning it was not clear how the dramatic situation was in Italy, because some make laugh even of the Italians saying that was so terrible. But if we're about in March, April, we understood that the situation was really dramatic and we really need help. So it was really great and help and big help full from around the world. Thank you very much, uh, Simona. I must the first conclusion was a little bit counterintuitive to what I was thinking, right? I was uh, I caught myself thinking that I assumed that the pandemic was damaging the organizations, especially those ones who developed international co connections. But your conclusion is totally counterintuitive that actually the pandemic actually helped them that because organizations got together. Thank you very much. We are to Ulla and looking forward to uh, hearing her thoughts on this, uh, Ulla. Okay, hello, uh, thank you um, for this introduction. Um, um, yeah, my name is Ula Papa. I'm also a member of the uh, expert group and um, I would like to give you um, some information about uh, how the pandemic uh, affected civil society organizations in Germany. And also here we see um, that um, it, uh, it affected um, organizations in very uh, different ways. Um, so I'm first starting with all the kind of negative um, uh, effects of the um, pandemic. So um, I mean, of course, um, uh, it, uh, the pandemic had a huge impact on uh, the ways organization could interact with each other. So very important side effect here, and that is um, time. So I've heard from very many activists um, that it has become more difficult uh, to organize uh, events because of um, time constraints. Uh, uh, many activists um, uh, yeah, need to spend uh, more uh, time for their regular jobs. So if they are volunteering, they have less uh, time for their voluntary uh, work. And um, very many people are more involved um, with uh, care activities at home. They need to take care of uh, homeschooling and um, other um, uh, things that are necessary uh, just to keep their um, ordinary life um, uh, going. And this means that people sometimes just cannot do uh, something more than that. So they need to take care of their, um, their family issues. And this means that um, uh, especially those organizations that um, uh, depend on volunteers, um, they face a lot of difficulties. And uh, in Germany, we could see that um, on the one hand, um, uh, organizations were less able to uh, actually do um, the, the services or carry out the services. Uh, for example, uh, in the social sphere, it has become more difficult to actually reach out to vulnerable um, populations and to deliver the services they want to deliver. Um, a lot of activities, um, let's say also in the cultural sector, they just uh, cannot be um, uh, carried out at this um, uh, over the last year. And um, so this is of course a huge restriction. On the other hand, um, there were also some positive effects of the um, pandemic. Um, it has been uh, become um, easier to exchange information like um, uh, online technologies have become, um, uh, yeah, uh, more widely used. Um, 
some civil society organizations have expanded their international networks and have actually um, yeah, expanded their, uh, their connections. And um, I would like to draw the attention of uh, something uh, interesting, and this is um, the new kind of solidarity campaigns. And these campaigns do not only um, um, address the issue of the pandemic itself, but also the political issues that um, have become important over the last year. So I'm just mentioning the situation in, uh, in Belarus, um, the protest movements in Russia, and also um, yeah, the events in um, the United States. So this, for um, the German public, these events are very um, yeah, boring, very, um, and there's a lot of people who, yeah, who become, um, who are very interested to follow um, these events and they want to understand what is going on and how this affects um, their own life. So uh, what we see is that um, new solidarity campaigns have been established. And just to give you one example, how these um, campaigns look like, I uh, just mentioned one initiative. The initiative is called uh, Voices from uh, Belarus, and it um, uh, was established by a group of uh, translators, cultural players, and historians. And um, these people translate um, texts from um, um, intellectuals from Belarus um, that translate these texts into German and publish them on a Facebook uh, site. They also collect texts to, to be published in um, books. And the aim is um, yeah, to give people from Belarus a voice yeah, to, um, uh, and to inform the, um, the public in Germany about what is going on in Belarus. Um, the project uh, was started in um, uh, September last year, and um, it now has more than 2,000 followers, um, and it has become a, a very important information source um, in Germany. This is just um, one initiative, and you can see that uh, a lot of people are following uh, this, and uh, they have become, uh, of course, there are also other initiatives uh, of people who inform about the situation in Belarus, and um, it is not only concerning um, information exchange, but also um, their crowdfunding initiatives and um, other support initiatives. People collect money, um, collect information to actually um, help people in, uh, in this situation. And um, I think it's interesting uh, for you to see that these networks do not only work on kind of the national level, but also at the local level. And therefore I would like to give you one example um, of an international initiative um, in the city um, where I live. Um, I live in uh, Greifswald, which is a, a small city um, uh, at the Baltic Sea. And uh, in this city, um, a new cultural center was opened um, in August last year. And this is kind of a typical cultural center. So it's kind of a house that is uh, home to uh, very many initiatives, um, including a cinema club and environmental organization um, and uh, some kind of cultural groups and a theater group and so on. And um, uh, yeah, it was planned for a couple of years. So um, the, it was a coincidence that it was opened um, last year and um, yeah, the, uh, the group of people, of course, is, is now facing um, the difficulty how to organize such a cultural center without a live uh, auditory, without a live public. And they do so in um, organizing all kind of uh, online events, um, solidarity concerts, and so on. And uh, also this group has actually um, uh, taken uh, the initiative to set up um, solidarity campaign with uh, Belarus. And um, there's a volunteer group and um, people are actually um, uh, planning to have um, uh, a volunteer exchange um, program with uh, Belarus. So this is just, yeah, to, to give you an impression that um, the kind of things that are um, interesting at the national level, they also, um, uh, applied and are brought to life in uh, small cities. It's not only that these kind of things are happening in Berlin, for example. 
Um, okay, so this is about the solidarity campaigns. Then I would like to show you that uh, in um, very specific areas of civil society, uh, life uh, um, went on as usual. Uh, for example, there is a joint campaign against uh, Nord Stream 2 uh, with for uh, this um, is of course a very um, sensitive political issue. And um, there are a couple of uh, environmental organizations that are um, um, taking joint action against the completion of this uh, pipeline. And um, the region, uh, the, the motivation for doing this are uh, environmental issues. So the, the pipeline is uh, regarded to be, yeah, um, doing um, a lot of harm to the, um, to the Baltic Sea and, um, the organi environmental organization, they started um, um, yeah, this campaign already uh, many years ago and uh, now they are taking legal action. So here you can see in a very specific um, activities, the, the pandemic does not really have a, an impact because um, what needs to be done is, uh, is done and this kind of legal action, the information exchange and uh, everything that you need to do in this specific area um, is carried out um, at this moment. Uh, and then last uh, but not least, I would like to show you something which is also new and also a positive uh, effect of uh, the pandemic. And this is um, that um, in Germany, um, there has been, uh, there have been a lot uh, more international projects and um, studies on civil society and philanthropy which were started to kind of, um, yeah, to provide information and to exchange information about civil society. So this is also something that, yeah, can be considered a positive effect of the pandemic as well, because as information exchange um, has intensified, there's also um, a renewed interest in um, civil society and, um, Many um, think tanks uh, on civil society have started new projects. Um, there are international debates about civil society development. Uh, and uh, for example, at our university, there's a new um, project on uh, social cohesion and civil society interaction, which just shows that um, this means there's also, um, there are also opportunities for civil society actors because it shows that there's interest from society um, on what civil society organizations are doing. So to, to summarize, uh, I think, um, yeah, the constraints, um, are, it's, it's more difficult and more time consuming, and this has become really demanding. On the other hand, um, there are also new opportunities um, with this, um, yeah, new um, possibilities for exchange and also, um, uh, new solidarity campaigns and new uh, research projects. Um, yeah, so thank you a lot. I'm, I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Ola. Uh, such a rich pool of information on actually the resilience of civil society uh, in times of the pandemic and on even more internationalization in some, uh, to some extent, and more international co connections. Uh, Thank you very much. And we're moving to Anna Sevartian, who uh, will share uh, her expertise and knowledge with us. Anna, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, um, everybody. Thank you, uh, Elena Belakurova and Andrei Dimidov. And I should be saying Dr. Belakurova, probably, P Professor Belakurova, <laughs> Professor Dimidov. Uh, but it's all uh, so horizontal um, in the um, in the working group and the expert group on the civil society research. Um, yes, it's my pleasure to um, share some of my, uh, I would say, not always uh, fully coherent and connected uh, uh, re well, remarks um, on the international cooperation in the times of Corona. And I will start with, uh, um, well, something that gives me, I guess, a, a ground to speak in this audience of uh, researchers. Um, last year, we've worked uh, with interviewing for the State of the Civil Society report, and Elena showed us a colorful 
uh, covers uh, for the report. So another one is now in the works. Um, I don't know yet the color, but Christina smolina Vaita, who's been working on the report, is also here with us. Um, and it has uh, a piece by uh, myself and Brian Harvey, my co-author. Uh, we've interviewed uh, civil society actors in various countries in the EU and Russia during the first uh, wave of corona pandemic. Um, and uh, well, my note here is that, of course, the situation for the civil society during the first, the second, and uh, I guess the third wave that is uh, coming up, or at least we've, we've read that it's uh, very likely it's, it's, it will be there. Uh, situation definitely is, uh, well, nuanced um, and uh, certain things uh, would be specific in our research about, uh, you know, what was happening during the first wave. But I will share just a few, again, broad uh, conclusions that, uh, that we've seen from that research um, and uh, it might resonate with what was already said uh, or be new. Um, and one of those uh, findings was that, yes, uh, uh, the strong gets stronger. It was true for the civil society, obviously, organizations with uh, a better capacity, uh, those that were developing this kind of anti-fragility uh, were also uh, able, capable of, of acting quite fast. Um, for a lot of smaller initiative, uh, yeah, it might have been uh, deadly, um, but I would dare say that uh, you know we're still in this limbo, in the pandemic limbo, and it's not clear whether organizations whether it's going to bounce back or not. Um, so for many organizations, they are you know uh, no longer active, not here, not there, and that's equally true for for Russia and for Europe. Uh, simply again, because I think so many uh, new topics were just. Um, actualized in this new context, uh, health issues, uh, the importance of one's own health and situation and thinking work, um, all of that. Um, so for some organizations that were more, yes, uh, uh, non-professionalized groups or volunteer organizations, uh, the demands uh, for time were simply uh, too high. So a lot of organizations are in the limbo, that's what I'm saying. Um, We've seen plenty of heroic examples where, again, NGOs did what they quite often do, especially in some repressive, but not also repressive contexts. Uh, they filled in the gap uh, that the states were not filling in, again, because they were, uh, well, immobilized by the enormity of uh, COVID challenge or by ignorance. Uh, um, uh, but we've seen NGOs in some places, yeah, being the only actors uh, that that were there. Uh, for instance, uh, in the migration uh, uh, in the refugee camps in Greece, in Greek on Greek islands, uh, or uh, organizations that kept the saving operations in the Mediterranean, because you know it all continued to happen uh, despite closed borders or. Um, it, these were organizations that simply, uh, well, reformatted uh, their services immediately or very fast uh, to start working in the new situation. Um, uh, say, I mean, a, a lot of a lot of lawyers um, working with the prison system that uh, started uh, uh, really driving everybody's attention that they're also in this pandemic, uh, all people are unequal and the inequality was also exacerbated. That's another uh, thing that we have observed uh, with Brian uh, while uh, interviewing. And then of course, the phenomenon of so-called, or we call it shadow pandemics, quoting one of our respondents. So uh, in fact, uh, of various uh, weaknesses of, of our social systems were again exacerbated by the pandemic and it became so much more obvious that the domestic violence is a huge issue again uh, for the whole of our region um, and in the situation of, of nowhere to go um, at the helplines uh, were overwhelmed and we're going to be still dealing with these consequences. Same goes for the psychological support and help. Uh, same goes for many other things. So a number of shadow pandemics. And uh, of course, there was a shadow pandemic, we call it, of, of non-freedom or unfreedom. 
freedom, uh, which means that in some places in the region, a uh, pandemic was used simply for grabbing um, uh, power by uh, well autocratic regimes. Uh, was very clearly uh, happening um, in some countries with the introduction of the new legislation. And uh, I would put Russia on the map here. Uh, I mean, not exclusively, not at all. Uh, we know uh, ruling by decree in, in Hungary and uh, other places, but uh, Russia is definitely there, especially with the pack of uh, uh, laws that uh, uh, attack or further limit uh, rights and freedoms that was just passed at the end of the 2020. But this is outside of the scope of the first wave. Uh, I guess that's the tendency that we've seen there. Um, uh, for Russia back then, it was uh, changing the constitution, amending the constitution. But then, unfortunately, this, this tendency continued. And uh, when we're done with the, uh, well, the immediate pandemic response, we will have to be dealing with those more restrictive uh, legislative uh, frameworks uh, in, in several countries. Um, so um, a little pause uh, here. Um, one more thing that's uh, no more, I mean, no longer uh, backed by our interviews and our research. Um, it's more of the uh, uh, things that I observe, I guess, in my daily work uh, through the EU Russian Civil Society Forum. Um, and we we feel, I mean, we can physically sense this uh, isolation uh, or isolationism or a combination of both uh, when we talk to, uh, to people. Uh, but say we speak with uh, Russian colleagues based in Mos you know, based in Moscow, based throughout Russia, um, and when they speak to us, uh, it might have been, um, I guess, for the Russian community, uh, well, more um, present this uh, feeling of inability to travel because at least within the EU, uh, well borders, the internal borders were not uh, entirely closed. So some degree of, of movement was uh, was possible. Now I'm hearing that the situation is actually very different. So uh, a colleague uh, that traveled to organize uh, a creative project in the city of Chelyabinsk in, in Russia, uh, uh, it's going to be happening in 2021, uh, was speaking about the parallel realities uh, in terms of, well, reaction to pandemic and the way society feels. Uh, well, here in Berlin, uh, we are with the, uh, well, still strict lockdown, which didn't become a mega lockdown that we were uh, uh, promised at some point. But uh, yes, people are wearing the FFP2, so strong protection and medical masks for all public spaces. And uh, well, the Russian reality looked very, very different uh, for that matter also with the faster rollout of immunizations available. But uh, these are parallel realities. I'm, why I'm speaking about it, I think we will be, it's a special task to start bridging them. Um, I mean, now we only have digital means or mostly digital means, but uh, when it becomes possible, uh, we will absolutely have to like reconnect these two, these two worlds and the, uh, the call for that is really strong, uh, at least on the Russian side. And here I'm coming to uh, a, a different uh, topic. Um, I uh, believe that yes, the new legislation, if we speak, you know, Russia and Europe, that the new legislation does make international cooperation more difficult, uh, does bring some extra demonization of international, everything international, everything foreign into the Russian context. So it's gonna be also there. It's gonna, uh, it's gonna shape, um, uh, the, 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 this whole uh, field of international cooperation. At the same time, um, uh, yeah, I was very happy to to hear, uh, Ula, that that you were um, underlining um, those uh, positive trends and. Uh, the awakening interest to the region, which I think is a very important thing to work on in Europe. Uh, since before the pandemic, I think what we were seeing was rather disconnect, um, you know, with open borders. Um, it's, it's, it would be a very good outcome if we have more of a interest and uh, connect, uh, though the borders are still 
still closed and between us. And definitely that mobilization on the on Belarus uh, is a very important example. Uh, I do see mobilization around uh, um, uh, well political developments in Russia and the recent protests and the uh, uh, record numbers of detainees um, at what's well will normally is simply allowed as uh, uh, as, as rallying outside, but no longer uh, with the new Russian legislation. Uh, so I think it would be very important that, again, those two things are connected, the, you know, Belarus and Russia um, and the solidarity and interest uh, in that region, uh, well, remains, at least that would be my wish for also the community of researchers, but also, of course, community of engaged citizens uh, because I, I'm sure that the panelists are trying, um, uh, well, are finding it hard to separate the scientists uh, as an activist in themselves. Uh, at least that's going to be my uh, uninformed uh, hypothesis. So I think I would be uh, rather stopping uh, in here uh, with the topic of digitalization that of course is a medium um, that is going to be gaining I mean it, it gained a lot of momentum uh, but uh, yes we do need to be uh, now I guess fighting uh, um, as citizens uh, so that digitalization is, is happening on our terms so to speak um, and uh, that needs to happen uh, in more technically progressed countries uh, or more democratically progressed countries, uh, we do want to uh, this field to remain free so that uh, cooperation is at least possible online before we uh, can see each other again. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, uh, Anna, for sharing uh, such a rich uh, like data uh, from your research. Uh, we have a lot on, uh, on our plate. I would like to open the floor uh, for questions and remarks, especially from the audience. Uh, but before that, Yelena uh, wanted to update us on our surveys and uh, say something else. Yelena, would you like to come in? Yes, thank you so very much for such an interesting uh, presentation and for amazing summary of the research that you've just presented. I think we've got some really interesting thoughts in here, which are related not only to international links and ties, but in general, how mm, civil society organiza organizations uh, today feel and uh, let me show you the first part of the question that mainly we have people from Russia, but uh, other countries are um, following suit. As uh, previously, we have lots of people in here who believe they are a part of a civil society organization or a participant thereof. And we can also see that a lot of uh, travels and trips have been canceled during the pandemic, but the quantities differ. The question uh, has only been published in Russia. Unfortunately, our foreign colleagues have not been able to answer that, and maybe they would have improved the statistics because uh, traveling within the EU is still an international travel because you have to cross uh, all the virtual the borders of the country. countries. Let me show you a different poll, though. And this poll will be more about um, what do you think changed in your own organization um, when it comes to international connections and ties? Let me launch the poll, and while it's hanging out there, uh, let me ask someone else to say something. Maybe you have an experience to share, maybe you have an insight to tell, maybe you have an organization that suffered and you want to um, explain us what happened. Did you have to close something? Did you have to change something? Or maybe something worked better now. We listened to both camps at the moment. Uh, there have been two groups of consequences. <clears throat> and yes, many travels have no longer been possible and lots of our traditional projects um, had to close down. But on the other hand, there is an opportunity of bringing in foreign exports cheaper now and to sometimes intensify communication to a larger extent. Maybe you have something to share 
if you're a participant or the listener to the session, uh, someone but the experts. Or you have questions to the experts, you're more than welcome to do so. I know for sure that we've got many uh, civil uh, forum EU Russia participants in here who unfortunately didn't, uh, they couldn't come over to our event. Igor, yes, you have the floor now, please. Introduce yourself shortly. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. My name is Igor Markarenko. I'm uh, the civil uh, agreement CEO. We actually had more international contacts because of the pandemic. Unfortunately, we had to reconsider some of our plans. In particular, a number of uh, trips were cancelled. Uh, but we held some extensive uh, consultations with the Lithuanian and Bulgarian experts. Estonia was also there. And although there was no life conversations, a window of opportunity still appeared. And this window of opportunity helped us to engage in a very extensive dialogue with representatives of various structures from different European countries, and that's a big plus. On the other hand, my uh, Novosibirian friends are growing tired of online. They really want to see me live. But this is not something that I can impact. I do whatever it takes. At least our discussions and the series of conversations we hold uh, continues Hopefully, our Swedish colleagues who have expressed the wish to cooperate with us will be able to uh, see us coming because uh, we want to really make a breakthrough working with our Swedish partners. Okay, anyone else willing to say something or who wants to add something? My name is Ashot Hairapetian. I'm the chairperson of the board of uh, intercultural um, collaboration center. It's already been said that pandemic impacted negatively the organizations that engage in international work. Our organization is responsible for is dealing with international conflicts resolution. And we can see that the pandemic impacted the extensive rise of uh, conflict potential, especially in this part of Europe. And we are gradually moving. We are uh, encroaching on the brink of Cold War, the new Cold War. This is something that we must definitely thwart. One of the main objectives of public diplomacy is to make sure that uh, public uh, society of different countries uh, continue to negotiate and talk to each other and to try to find and elaborate the common language to avoid the second Cold War from happening because it will never produce anything good. Nothing good can come out of a Cold War. N not for Russia, not for anyone else. And the more partners we have, the more projects, joint projects we conduct, the more or the bigger is the chance that uh, such a situation is avoided. The more we understand each other, the more we know what can be done to improve the relations between our countries, to improve the dialogue between the nations. That's as first. The second thing I'd like to say, the new law on foreign agents. We need our state to specify what it means to do politics. Because I know examples when a national when one organization that doesn't do any politics, but it has Armenian, Lithuanian or Polish roots, and they do have to contact sometimes or interact with their compatriots, they get presents from them, gifts or donations. These organizations can easily land in the list of foreign agents because a foreign organization might have given support to them. So some very clear criteria are required. What does it mean to be a foreign agent? And when will a, a uh, civil society organization turn into a foreign agent? On the one hand, our government wants uh, civil society organizations to do politics. On the other hand, there are lots of limitations that will limit 
um, this activity. So the rules of the game have to be clear and uh, they have to be comprehensible. This is a very valuable thought and it's a very sensible um, statement. That's what Anna has been saying already. What we're observing at the moment, uh, we're observing a shift in international cooperation activities. Uh, the fewer personal contacts are there, the more leeway is there for a state to manipulate um, minds of people and the conflict potential, like you're saying, is growing. So we, representatives of civil society, have to do our utmost to restore the status quo. Natalia, you wanted to say something, is that correct? Uh, you have to turn your mic on. Yes, I have this uh, hand, icon, hand icon, I don't see it. Do I have it? Yes. My question goes to representatives of various countries regarding uh, vaccination, COVID jabs. Do you think it will make a breakthrough? Because on one hand, uh, a vaccination gives you freedom, on one hand, maybe, maybe, I don't know. So how does it happen in your countries? In Russia, you can go and have a jab anywhere. It's free of charge. It's any time, um, no cues. On the other hand, uh, if you're vaccinated or, I mean, if you have uh, fallen ill with COVID and then you survived it, you no longer pose any danger. You no longer pose any threats and you can uh, live the life to its fullest, so it's like a freedom of Muno. So that, how does it happen in other countries? That's my question. Thanks a lot. Uh, let's give the floor to the experts and uh, let them explain that, and then we'll move towards the second question right away. And I can see that Larissa has been nodding quite extensively regarding the vaccination. I live in Siberia. Siberia is a distant region. We're not from. Moscow, we're not from St. Pete's, it's not as easy as you say. You can only register for vaccination through uh, e-government service and the queue is pretty long and you can't get a vaccine. And as far as I know, a friend of mine living in St. Petersburg has been waiting for this uh, vaccination slot for so much. Yeah, they talk about it a lot, but there is no massive vaccination campaign. I work in a university and we have 3,000 employees, 14,000 students, and we are not being vaccinated. So that's the situation. It's not as simple as it's as it's being painted, so to speak. Not like you see it from Moscow. Do you think it will solve the problem? The problem? Do you think the vaccination will solve the problem? I would have probably gone and vaccinated myself, yeah. Because I do believe in medicine. And I want to be free. And I don't want to be a threat to any other people. And myself, I actually want to avoid being ill with COVID. I had my relatives uh, who caught that disease. I want to be free, Natalia. That's the most important thing for me. Thank you so much. Ula, do you have anything to say about Germany? Okay, yeah, maybe I can just uh, tell a little bit about the vaccination campaign in Germany. Here, uh, the vaccination started at uh, uh, the end of December um, last year. And um, it's all organized, so it means that um, uh, the first priority are vulnerable um, people, um, the elderly uh, above 80 years old, and those people are working in medical institutions. And, um, uh, and then in the second round, um, people can uh, just um, announce that they would like to to be vaccinated, but we have are now in the first round, which means that uh, people are approached by the healthcare uh, institutions uh, if they belong to the vulnerable groups. And um, so at this moment, I think about 2% uh, of the population is uh, vaccinated. Um, so, um, uh, and it's all members of uh, vulnerable groups or medical staff. Uh, and before the vaccination started, uh, there had been a number of uh, surveys conducted by state institutions and people were asked whether they were actually um, uh, wanting to be vaccinated. And um, because in Germany, there are also quite a number of people who are skeptical about vaccinations in general and skeptical about this specific uh, vaccinations. Um, 
And so the estimation was that only about 50 to 60% of the population wants to be vaccinated. And um, uh, so it has been a political issue and it was announced that a vaccination is voluntary. So nobody is forced to be uh, vaccinated. And I think in the course of the events, more and more people um, will also be, um, they will also want, they, it will turn out that more people um, will want to have uh, to be vaccinated. Um, because they will see that uh, the vaccination is not harmful and that it actually uh, is good to be vaccinated. And um, there's also a political discussion about the fact, um, yeah, should there be um, advantages for those people who are vaccinated? So should they be allowed to go on vacation or to um, move free more freely? And uh, this was... Um, this discussion is kind of postponed or, yeah, it's, it's very politicized. So the politicians want to avoid um, any statements about this because clearly it um, will play into the hand of those people uh, who are opposed to vaccination because they will say, oh, now they kind of force us in a, um, in a indirect way, yeah, by saying uh, only those who are vaccinated can do this and this. It means, yeah, we are forced um, to be vaccinated. And this is kind of um, uh, a politician thing. This needs to be avoided. So of course, um, the, the whole uh, debate is not, um, is not there. But in the end, I think uh, if it comes to, let's say, um, flights or um, hotels, so all kind of um, uh, for-profit, um, mm, I mean, business activities, of course, there will be uh, some kind of um, thing like, okay, um, vaccinated people can already go to, I don't know, can check in, in an hotel. So it will be, in the end, it will be an advantage. And I think um, what is, again, what is positive um, here, people are kind of very patient. So people are just waiting, um, yeah, for them to, um, so at this moment for uh, the majority of the population is just to be patient and to wait until, um, yeah, until they um, are able to get a vaccination. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Simona, could you say something on Italy? Yes, uh, also in Italy, we start during Christmas time to give our the vaccination to our population. And the government choice was to start from doctors and in general, the people who works in the hospital as more um, people who could get the, um, the COVID. And also we, st we already started to vaccinate the people who already have some kind of sickness or works in the public sectors. And unfortunately, the debate on the vaccines was uh, um, covered by a new problems we have now in Italy in terms of our new government, because our prime minister just resigned, I think, around 10 days ago, a week ago. So now our main, I mean, huge problem also in order to manage the vaccination organization, to have as soon as possible our prime uh, minister. So if the first step was quite fine, I look forward to see the second step. I mean, when the, the vaccination will be broader in terms of population, because you know, Italy is not a champion in terms of organization and efficiency in terms of you no know, public uh, um, service. So I'm quite a bit skeptical, scared about how is, is going on. And finally, there is um, a, sh a small debate in terms of people who are against the COVID. They say that the COVID is just uh, an invention from someone and they will not get the vaccination. But thanks to God, it's a very small part of the population. So they don't have a great uh, public op um, opinion. Yes, thank you. Sergey has been extending his hand for a very long period of time. You want to comment on that or something else? Yes, I want to comment on that. Thanks a lot. 
I'm Sergei Tereshenkov. I'm from the EU Russia uh, Civil Forum. Let me express my own opinion because I've been thinking about that. Um, Ula told us that um, the uh, politicians are really cautious in the statements they make. Now, it's absolutely clear why they're so cautious, because it's a very sensible issue to talk about. Because on one hand, it becomes clear that vaccination will reduce um, personal health risks, and it will reduce the risk of someone posing a threat. So, but it's a very hard ethical choice, I think. So what's uh, what do you choose? Something that's better for yourself or something that's better for the society? Any person will have to decide it by himself or herself. But there's another aspect to that, which is uh, human rights. Imagine you're not vaccinated and then you can't go to a theater or you're banned from uh, receiving any other sort of benefits. It's a complicated issue, something that we have to really be careful about, something that uh, we need to start um, discussing already now and try to elaborate a common solution on that or a common position on that, because it seems to be normal to us today when we're going to the airport that you are not allowed to bring in um, as cabin luggage like uh, liquids which exceed 100 ml and uh, you're absolutely okay with having a body check maybe soon it will be absolutely normal to demonstrate and to present your vaccination passport by the first request how okay is that in terms of uh, human rights well, that's a question to answer on the other hand your right finishes when the rights of others start so it's a very difficult and a very complex and a very comprehensive ethical problem that has to be dealt with. When it comes to Russia, there is uh, one final statement. Uh, we can't really say that our vaccination campaign is voluntary. Uh, medical personnel, meaning medical workers in those regions that I am um, aware of, like PERM, had to have their vaccination some categories of population were forced to do the vaccination it was a compulsory thing for them thanks a lot as far as vaccination that's our next question this is something that actually as as, as as a member of the audience at this time because i think what we all have been talking about like in the last 10 minutes is actually actually directly relates to our second question namely to live communication and discussion and a, and a debate about something that's uh, basically related that everyone can relate to yeah and that's probably the vaccination the legal issue of the vaccination the political issue of vaccination the human rights issue is perhaps like one of the biggest normative debates at the moment I mean that we are facing right as, as actually as, as members of civil society, as individual members of civil society, and as representatives of our organization. And speaking about international connections and actually the need and the thirst for this kind of discussion, as a Russian citizen, I found myself uh, sort of uh, like living in Europe in the middle of the pandemic. And what I realized, what I noticed actually in the last couple of months, maybe three or four months, was that in a situation when uh, there's not much information about how Russia is handling the pandemic, people, and I'm talking about my friends and I'm talking about my, my colleagues and, and people I know, have been actually approaching me and asking, so Andre, what's going on in Russia? Which made me think that, yes, I mean, we all exist in informational bubbles. We're here in the European Union and like Russians are in Russia. But there is the uh, need uh, from the European society to know, actually, uh, because like we are all in this, uh, I, I don't want to say bad word, we are all in this together, right? And there is a need and there is an interest uh, in the European society in how this is handling in Russia. And that need is directly also related to this normative debate. Okay, so how do you guys 
what do you guys think about the vaccination? Yeah, what does your state think about the vaccination? Like, and what, what's the opinion of civil society? How do you guys like relate to this? And I actually found, sorry, I'm sharing quite, quite a personal yes story here. And I actually found that uh, this void yeah, between uh, the knowledge of, of ordinary Europeans and or European civil society about how, how this debate is solved in Russia, uh, this void be be between the European knowledge and the Russian knowledge is not actually filled. And I was thinking that, yes, I would like, I would like to, to, to see civil society stepping in and sort of like reconnecting these two spaces. And uh, I don't know whether that's possible or maybe I'm just fantasizing at this very moment, right? But uh, yeah, reconnecting the spaces where exactly where the discussion is needed, exactly where uh, the communication is needed and sharing of opinions. And uh, sorry, that was like a very abstract intervention. Yeah, but I, I have a feeling it's, it's of direct relevance for our second uh, issue, yeah, like live communication is no longer possible, it's online, but there is this big elephant in the room that everyone wants to discuss, actually, and share their opinions. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> Спасибо большое, Андрей. Мне кажется, это тоже наводит на мысли. Thank you, Andrei. Indeed, it's very thought-provoking. This idea that we are living in, in parallel worlds, and these worlds may be different, like free Europe, unfree Russia, and uh, maybe now it's uh, the other way around. And again, we are facing new challenges at the same time. I wanted to show you the results of our poll, what we got. So loss of international partnership turns out is not that great a problem, uh, at least among our participants. 55% uh, say that their international cooperation remained unchanged. So in this regard, I think uh, it's, it's good. I mean, 55% is good. We managed to save a lot. Professional liaisons, um, connections that we carry on. I mean, like first level interaction, so to say. But we are losing personal connections at the same time. And it's interesting to, to look into this. Has the meaning changed? We are running out of time. We have something like 12 minutes left, but maybe we can address this question. Um, I'd like to ask our experts to answer this question. How is the nature of cooperation changing? What are we losing or the other way around? Maybe we are not losing something. Maybe we are gaining something. And I'm going to start my last poll. Does anyone want to be the first to take this question? Feel free to do this. Can I start? Because I, I wanted to, uh, to answer to Andre's remark. Russia began publishing official statistics uh, showing the number of people who fell ill, who uh, died. You may question its relevance and accuracy, uh, but uh, you can also use the data about excess mortality. So how many ex like extra deaths happened? And uh, there's, there was another publication by my colleagues, Nina Rzhanovska at the Canon Institute. And she uh, did a research about the reaction of civil society organizations, uh, how civil society organizations reacted to the pandemic. I think it's, it's, uh, it's an important study. And uh, getting to the second question, I think, think that the pandemic enabled us to uh, maintain the strong personal ties that we already had. It enabled us to support each other emotionally because it was and still is hard to work in such an environment. 
and people working on different projects, uh, people who are uh, teaching, for instance, can vouch safe that now it's harder to, to work and uh, there is more work. People are overworked. My French colleague who is working at the uh, Free University of Brussels, a mother of two school children, she's working from home. I don't know how she's coping with this. And she was carrying out many Caucasus projects. Merlin, maybe you, you've, you've known her. She's a very well-known expert. And we talked today. Uh, how, how, she, she speaks Russian and she asked me, um, how, how do you, how do you uh, say this in Russian when you cannot be uh, close to, to someone? Well, you, you, are, you are distant in any way, in any meaning. Uh, we are getting distant. Uh, but at the same time, uh, well, it's a challenge. Uh, uh, trying to stay close when you are distant is a big challenge, especially for those of us who work in civil society, um, organizations, personal contacts, personal ties are crucial com component of, of their work. And being distant, being remote from your counterparts is a huge challenge because uh, it's a major part of their work. Someone who is not working with people uh, may have had it better. But uh, for those of us who need personal contact, um, the pandemic was a big challenge and it led to a cool down, so to say, a weakening of these personal ties, exactly because the conditions are so challenging today. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. It's a very yeah. right here, I mean, yeah. relevant, interesting question. The first aspect, I will say that our cooperation changed in Italy in the civil society organizations is that before COVID, we were mainly focused to help other countries or to have our international relations in terms of um, giving our contribution, for example, to the developing countries. Mm -hmm. What struck us and what is changed is on the other way around now. So we are mainly receiving help from other organizations, even in some, in some cases, organizations that have used to be helped by Italian civil society organizations. Um, the other aspect is changed the, the activities in terms of the, the cooperation. As we said before, um, before COVID, they, they were mainly focused no, on human rights and culture as the two main um, sector of activities, let, let's say. While now there are new sector of activities like you know, the health sector, but even just helping people who are losing their job in terms of solidarity and uh, helping with uh, even with food and primary uh, needs of the, the people. So for sure, the, the decision that the CV, in general, the civil society of Italian organization decided was to coping together this moment instead of uh, um, uh, growing uh, apart. And uh, yeah, I think that's the almost our you know, changing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and this is a, 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 an interesting effect that the pandemic is causing because some things are well, changing. It's like a complete reversal. Ula, I see that uh, Ula is discussing the Russian vaccine uh, in our chat. Could you tell us a couple of words about this? Interesting uh, about this and um, is that 
it shows us kind of the value of uh, um, uh, fact-based information. Yeah, because there's at this moment there's uh, in Germany we have a discussion about um, the Russian vaccine. Uh, should it be um, uh, used in Germany as well? And there are at this moment medical experts um, that are in favor and those uh, that are against it. And this is just, um, yeah, one discussion. And here I cannot even decide uh, on which side I am because I don't have the medical information about this. But uh, it really shows how important um, information is. And um, yeah, and also, um, uh, evidence-based information that we can really um, see whether it's true or not. And we see this in so many um, political um, areas. Yeah, it's health, but it's also connected to, I mean, all kind of these political events. Uh, obviously, um, at this moment, if we um, follow the events in, uh, in Russia, it really depends on um, what kind of information source you are following? Um, this is what the, the picture that you you get from the from the situation. So, uh, and this also showed that civil society can actually be very important here, um, kind of as, as fact checkers and um, yeah, to really uh, value also the um, the information which is needed for good policy making because this is in in the end what we all need. We need to have. Uh, good knowledge and then um, act upon this uh, with this information. And um, it's also um, good that uh, Andre mentioned, yeah, that um, the situation at this moment, it um, it's really disturbing because um, sometimes we lose the information about what is really going on in other countries because um, yeah, we might not have um, good information about this. And I think that uh, civil society can play a very important role here. Thank you. Okay. Um, so who would like to add something? <laughs> Andre? May I say the, uh -huh. let's say the, the Italian view respect to the Russian vaccine. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I have to say that in Italy, the public opinion is quite about skeptical when we speak about Russia. So even if there are not um, a, a medical evidence no, about the if it's good or bad, the vaccine, the public opinion was very skeptical, just taking for granted that since it was from Russia, was not, uh, it should be not so good. And that's, I'm very sorry to say, because that is a consequence of, uh, how can I say, a cultural no, um, view from, no, from the past, I mean, from view, viewing a country just from a, a, a preconception. And so for me, the, there will be no problem in terms of where does the, the vaccine come. The question it should be if the, there is medical evidence that it, it works, so it will be a good uh, option. I think also we need as much as possible different machines, a different machine from different countries, because uh, having only few producers only one choice, it will be not helpful for uh, our health. So uh, in terms of no, th thinking about uh, no, in a civil society mind, it will be as much as possible helpful to have more options. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Anna, Thank you. Anna, you wanted to say something probably? comments because I think we're nearing the end uh, but uh, yeah to uh, I guess nobody is an expert on vaccines in this audience um, <laughs> so coming from a very different line of training but uh, of course that's what on everybody's mind so we feel like we know a lot about it at the same time I don't think that uh, yeah I mean we can really connect to uh, we have to trust here that's the problem uh, or that's the that's life we need to trust uh, and this is exactly where we do have a problem uh, mm -hmm. in this uh, particular um, 
you know, world of the EU and Russia, uh, because clearly, um, you know, Russia is uh, is not being um, well, transparent in terms of uh, delivering information. So there were lots of questions about uh, statistics and all of these things. And then, of course, there is mistrust. Uh, and of course, there is disinformation uh, campaigns online and so on and so forth. So it's very it's very difficult to expect then trust um, um, in um, uh, maybe the most efficient vaccine, whatever, or a very good product, because the context is such that we don't have this trust. This is, of course, the, the role where, you know, people to people relations are extremely important, where we might be at least, you know, building those circles of trust. And this is where I see, again, our call, uh, our role as civil society actors. Um, well, the big question was how the international cooperation uh, is and will be changing. Um, I will allow myself uh, one more comment on the on the uh, civil society role uh, with relation to this whole uh, field of public health and vaccines. That again, I guess maybe for the first time after uh, the um, HIV age uh, or HIV uh, AIDS uh, moment uh, came into the kind of public focus that that clearly. So you know, 30 years ago we we had big conversation. Um, I, I don't think that the local crisis uh, uh, in public health in specific regions like with Ebola uh, really reached us to the same degree as now uh, Corona did. But we have a big, big issue here. It is the access and equality, you know, the usual topics of the civil society with regards to distribution, to access, to um, uh, health. And in that case, this is to having this shot. Um, of vaccine by whichever producer. Uh, and again, the region we're talking here, I guess, is in a very privileged situation still, both, you know, Russia for uh, having developed, you know, its own vaccine, um, and Europe having developed several vaccines. Uh, of course, there are regions where it's not happening. Um, they are out of our picture, but uh, yeah, uh, I think we need to be also bringing them um, uh, on that picture, because the overall, uh, uh, again, situation with the pandemic will depend on, um, again, availability, not just for developed and developing countries, sorry for that language that you might not be using, but uh, for the lack of a better language, uh, but also uh, a very big part of the world that doesn't have that access. So I think we have really big questions. And again, the role of the civil society would be at least I mean, partially mitigating where we can, uh, where we have expertise um, or stepping in, uh, partially also by bringing it to the agenda uh, of, um, yeah, of, of, you know, world players and systems and putting it on our own agenda. So I think that's really, uh, yeah, again, a huge field where we can be cooperating, uh, opening up, uh, but, uh, Yes, I will underline the uh, the issue of trust uh, and mistrust. That uh, where that's that's exactly the field where we need to be working super actively if we want to. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> get over um, and move from uh, get over the pandemic uh, and restrictions and uh, mm, switch to the uh, post pandemic recovery mode. Uh, this is still yet to come and maybe not fully in 2021. So it's a very topical discussion. Thank you. Да, спасибо большое, Анна. Мне кажется, это очень, в принципе, хороший заключительный слова. Thank you, Anna. I think these are very good concluding remarks. Nothing to be said, but Ashot is itching to say something. But please be short because we're, well, very short on time. Time is running out. We still don't hear you, Ashot. Uh, I will try to be very brief. Let me remind you that before the uh, World Cup, um, FIFA World Cup in Russia, well, there's been lots of uh, comments that the World Cup is going to be organized very badly, that uh, various uh, minorities are going to be treated badly, and we held an international conference in Moscow together with our British partners, and we invited representatives of uh, various national minorities, mainly Muslims, from uh, hosting cities 
of the World Cup, and we asked them, how will the locals uh, will treat this kind of event? And they said to us, well, they're welcoming it. They're more than happy to have it. And that's why, well, what we got in the end is an amazing event. So it was an important step of uh, public democ uh, diplomacy. Not everything that's coming from Russia is bad. And hopefully that the Sputnik vaccine is going to be a good one. And it will help not only Russia, but other countries as well to combat the pandemic and its consequences. And I'm pretty sure that in Hungary and Georgia and any other countries, other developments might come suit and uh, they might, although solutions might also be useful. Every country has to be treated equally. Every country and every nation has to be given equal opportunities. And uh, why not in healthcare? Thanks. Thank you so much. And I would like to show you some of the recent poll results. What we didn't put in are some of the areas of cooperation that actually we've been talking a lot about today. And uh, some of the areas of cooperation that require, according to our discussion, uh, the biggest attention, meaning solidarity, mutual trust and understanding in solving, in overcoming prejudices and stereotypes that are now actively being used uh, by various uh, political forces. Andrei, is there anything you want to say? Uh, Elena and I, we were having a meeting uh, shortly before the online discussion, and my moods, I think, in that meeting were very, very passive and very pessimistic, actually. Yeah, I was saying, Lena, I don't know how is it going to go. Like, I have a feeling that there's no international cooperation. This is the pandemic. Like, everyone is disconnected, and everyone is just, like, sitting at home. And I want to share at this very moment, I'm so happy that these arguments of mine have been actually rebuffed and uh, turned over by our experts because what I've heard and I'm so I've never been happier to to be mistaken actually in my hypothesizing and and, and argument uh, what I've heard from our experts is an excellent uh, actually depiction of how the pandemic uh, in my opinion has increased the resilience of civil society and civil society organizations who have uh, made a lot of effort to actually reconnect and to stay connected and to keep the international like ties and so on and so forth. That's not working without uh, problems. And I here I second Anna uh, and uh, her concerns about the political developments, both in Russia in, and, and in Europe and about the debates that are going on at the moment and unresolved issues such as equality and access and so on and so forth. But uh, I will just stay with this uh, positive uh, thing that I am bringing uh, with myself uh, tonight, which is uh, actually learning that maybe not everything that bad and that uh, destroyed by the pandemic in terms of international cooperation, as I thought. Thank you very much. I was extremely happy to see you, especially our old colleagues, Larissa, Simona, Ulla. Thank you very much, Anna, for sharing your experience. And thank you very much, the audience, for being with us. Thank you so much. And it concludes our today's session. But should you have any suggestions or comments, you are more than welcome to um, drop us a line together with the Friedrich Ebert Stifting. We can come up with new questions and discussions. We might not just discuss the pandemic, but generally some of the overarching issues that we face in various countries and contexts, because now we, th we see that our joint communication is as relevant as never. Thanks a lot to all the participants. Have a very nice day and a good evening. And thanks to all the partners who made this event possible. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.